Uh, thank you all very much for coming, for attending today. I'm very pleased to see you. I'm going to do three things today, three topics today. And uh, I, um, um, I'll try and get through it as, as, quick, as quickly, as steadily as I can. But I will, I'll probably take a break somewhere in the middle of it for a few minutes. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is some of the time value consideration calculations last week, Salorma's um, uh, wanted me to just go over them one more time with you, one more, one narrow aspect of it. So I thought I would just start with that right in the beginning. And then the, uh, the second thing I'm going to do is um, hand out the next coursework. Now I wasn't going to do this until next week, actually. It's on the schedule for, for next week. But I thought I'd get a head start Everyone seems to be pushing ahead with the, with the uh, coursework number one, and this is a complementary piece of work. So they, the two should fit in together. So I wanted to give you, before you submitted it this Sunday, just give you a brief um, idea about what's going to be covered. Um, some of you may think that uh, material in the second coursework should be submitted with the first, but I just wanted to assure you that all aspects of this particular project are going to be covered between the two courseworks. So this is a this is the risk part. Now I'm actually handing out the assignment, and I'll discuss the assignment before I give my first lecture, lecture on risk management. So actually, the, I wanted to get you thinking about the kind of challenges, the kind of problems that you have to be solved, that have to be solved, and in that way you can listen a little bit more attentively to my lectures. You'll know what what you'll you have to deliver. Um, so that's, how, that's the order I'm going to do things in. Um, but before we get started, oh sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to record this on audio. Is everyone following the audio and video? Is anyone using it? Yes. Good. So I'm going to record this as lecture on, um, first I'm going to talk about uh, the, um, just one minor point of uh, Salorm's um, lecture last week, uh, which I wanted to cover in a little bit more detail. Um, so I'm going to first do that, um, if anyone, no one objects, um, so, I'm going to take this off. Um, so if you remember from last week, there was uh, a certain amount of work that went into understanding these equations that um, are used for, um, es essentially for discounted cash flow analysis. And I'm sure that Salorm expressed things very carefully. I hope he did. Um, but the idea behind the discounted cash flow is that you have a series of future payments and receipts, income and outgoing. And uh, you have different projects. And each project is kind of unique. It has its own pattern of cash flow. And we looked at these in terms of a graphical representation. And I'm showing you just one, one right here. Um, and it's a very good way, one very good way to compare these things is to come up with a sort of a, a summary value um, so that you can compare different projects or different systems. Um, so this is a very common technique actually and it, it's a way of, of um, enabling yourself to evaluate projects or systems that are quite different um, but you can draw them into summary, you can make use of summary numbers. As long as the summary numbers are done in an appropriate way, um, then, uh, then the, then the um, comparison is valid. Now, we're used to using these numbers all the time. Um, if we're comparing two mortgages, uh, one offers, uh, you, you get a mortgage at a four and a quarter percent, uh, but you have to pay a thousand pounds fee, or you have a mortgage at five and a quarter percent, but you have no fees. I mean, this is a very similar kind of thing. You have different payment schedules. You have a different repayment. Maybe you have a different repayment date. Um, you have a different upfront payments that you have to do at the very beginning. So we, if anyone's ever bought a house or a flat or something like that, you know you have to go through a rigmarole in order to fix, find the right mortgage. And uh, we make these sorts of decisions. This is exactly the kind of comparison that you are making for these, um, for these projects. Now, the, the formulas are, are really pretty easy, and um, um, Silorm, I think, has distributed some worksheets for you 
uh, to use and to practice with these things. We give you partial answers so you can work out. It's all done quite in a quite straightforward way in the, um, in, it's a straightforward way in spreadsheets. And you'll have a chance to practice them with the worksheets that we've handed out. And, um, and then you check whether you're doing a good job by looking at the answers or partial answers. And then uh, the quiz, which is, uh, it is uh, this Sunday is the due date, but actually we've decided to extend it for two nights. So it's not due until Tuesday night. And that's just to give, we're a little, we realize we're a little bit, um, there's a few loose ends about the time value thing. So we've decided to give it an additional two days. So we'll submit you the, um, we'll submit you the, um, the preparation brief as I've done before, 48 before, 48 hours before the quiz opens up. So you'll have a few, a full three days uh, in, in which to, to actually work on the quiz. Um, I'll, I'll go into that in more detail later. I'll send a separate email to, to cover that sort of thing. But I just wanted to review these cash flow things because sometimes people find, find it a little bit difficult to work through. Um, now, the one, uh, one of the main issues uh, with these equations, it's a fairly straightforward equation, I'm sure he's derived it and shown you how it's done, is that we're generally given annual rates. So everyone's very familiar with 4% a year, 12% a year, APR, APR is an abbreviation for annual percentage rate, and that's, like, that's the, that's the um, annual version. Um, but of course, when we go to do the calculations, um, chances are we're working on a monthly budget or weekly, sometimes even a daily budget. Uh, and because of this, um, you're going to want to adjust your equations um, so that they work on a monthly, daily, weekly. You can even go down to the seconds or um, you know, fraction of a second if you want. Uh, and, uh, and, and in that way, you can, um, can actually use these things for, for something practical. And um, if, if the world and our repayments were exactly on December 31st or January 1st, all of a sudden it would be very easy. But our repayments are in the middle of the month or at the end of the month or we get income in, we pay it off early. All this kind of stuff complicates these formulas a little bit. Um, so there is a, a little bit of a conversion that needs to take place. And I'll try and explain that in a way that you can go off. Has, has everyone heard this bit before? Did Silorm talk about this, this conversion rates? He didn't talk about it? He did, he did briefly. Okay, well, I'll just grind it in a little bit more and make sure you understand it. But anyhow, everyone is, um, I hope by now, is familiar with this basic fo formula where the future value, that is the, the future value of an investment, is worth the present value um, times 1 plus i, i being the interest rate, and then n is the, uh, the, the number of time periods. And in this case, it's, it's years. Um, but as mentioned, we really want to change that to something like months or weeks or, or days, something like that. Um, so, um, let's just jump to this right now um, and, um, and talk a little bit about what, what, that, what this actually means. So we end up having um, we, we, we end up having to um, to draw on a simple uh, um, uh, equ equality, and um, the just let me explain the terms here. So I sub x, which is the top line here, is the is the, is the amount that you want to calculate. So that could be months or weeks or or um, or seconds, and, and x is the number of divisions, like twelve or three sixty five or. 5,000, something like that. And then I, y is, I sub y over here is the annual interest rate. So when we talk daily about interest rates, we almost always talk about a um, APR, an annual rate. And that is expressed in, in i. And um, we also have um, that division. So that division would normally be taken just as a, a 1. We're converting from 1 to 12 or 1 to 365. So the y in this case would be 1. And we end up with an equality. These actually have to, in the end, equal the same thing. And because of this equality, we're left with this rather gruesome looking equation. Um, 
which you might be intimidated by. Would, would anyone know how to program an equation like that into, into Excel? Would it be easy to do for you? Did you know about how, how, to, how to go about doing it? Have no clue? No, no idea whatsoever? Okay, so um, does anyone know, does everyone know about functions in, um, in, in uh, uh, and so this is just a normal function. So in Excel, you would um, set up a number of columns. Uh, I can show you how it's done. Um, you set up a number of columns. In one column, you have the um, uh, i sub x. In the other column, you have x. In the other one, you have i sub y. And then you have a y. So you have four columns. And then one of those columns will be um, your answer. So you have four variables, as it were. Um, and you're interested in, in only one of these. Really, the answer comes out as being the new interest rate. Um, so um, the way that you would set it up as a function is you would go equal, um, open parentheses, 1 plus, and then you would pick the column where you've placed this i sub y. And I told you i sub y, for our purposes, is, is, is equal to 1. Um, is that right? No, I sub y, sorry, that's the interest rate um, expressed in annual terms. And then you would go y, uh, raise this thing, you would close the parentheses, and then you would use the, the, the hat key, which is a, a power key. And then you would do open parentheses again, and then you would go, um, you would pick the column where you put the y divisions, and you would pick, divide it by the column where you put the x divisions, and then you would close it, and then you would subtract the entire thing from, um, uh, from you would subtract one from the entire, this entire beast. Now, I've told you these are the divisions. So in this case, um, y would be equal to 1. That's the annual. And then x would be equal to whatever divisions you're making, 12 for months, 365 for, week, uh, for days, um, 52 for weeks. So this is generally 1 over some bigger number. Um, now, there's a foolproof method for making sure that you don't end up with an absolutely absurd number. Yes? I sub y and y are different numbers in this number, right? I'm sorry? Yeah, 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 they're different. I'll explain it. You'll, it'll, come, it'll come popping out in... It'll come popping out in lucid clarity um, in, in just a minute. You'll see, you'll see what I'm getting at. Now, I've developed an absolutely idiot-proof way to make sure that you don't come with, with um, absurd numbers. The biggest, there's two main issues here. One of them is when we talk about percentages, we tend to forget that there's an underlying number. So when we're talking about 12%, um, it, the actual number is 0.12. So when you're talking about percentage, it's always a fraction of, of one, a version of one. Uh, or a, a, uh, a ratio of one. So when you're using these equations, you, make, you have to make sure that you're not expressing it in percentages, but in the real value. So 40% would be uh, not 0.4. 12% would be 0 0.2, 0 0.12. So if you understand what, you have to unhinge a little bit the, the connection between, because if you start putting in the percentage values here, um, you're going to mess it up. And now there's a foolproof way to make sure that you haven't made an error in these calculations, and I'll tell you about them in a second. Um, now I've done just a few of these. I've, I've put together a little table. I did it on a spreadsheet, and I just copied and pasted it into here. And so this is the annual rate. This, is the, this would be your I sub Y in my previous formula. And this is the divisions, um, I think it's y over x. So this would be the, the x division. So the y division would be a 1. And I've left it out here because it's the same for all of these. And all, in all of these, we're calculating um, uh, the monthly or the, the um, weekly or daily division um, by, the, uh, by the given annual division. So it's basically 6 divided by 12, 6 divided by 6. 6 divided by 4. Um, but, um, and if we did these divisions, if anyone could do 6, uh, six divided by 12, it, it was 0.5. And if you notice this, it's ever so slightly less than 0.5. It's 0.49. Um, 6 divided, so these are, this is 6%, but taking every other month. 
So I'm given a repayment schedule. I'm paying back interest on a 6% loan, but I'm not paying every single month. I'm paying every other month. Now at the end of the year, I have to pay back that in the entire amount that I owe for that entire year. Um, but I'm paying back only a part of it every other month. And you would think it would be around 6 divided by 6 is 1. So I'd be paying roughly 1% a year um, for my repayment schedule. So I borrowed money at 6%. I'm paying back not every year, but every other month. So I'm making 6 um, bi-monthly payments every year. And the interest rate for that particular, in order to calculate how much I have to pay back on that every other month repayment, I calculated using the, that really ugly formula I showed you on the, day, on the page before. But roughly speaking, I can kind of approximate it because there's six divisions and six percent a year. So it'll be roughly one percent of the total year. Now if you notice here that, that these, these actual real numbers that you're using in your, in your, for your calculations, they're ever so slightly less. So this is, this is ever so slightly less than one. This is ever so slightly less than 0.5. Um, this would be 6 uh, divided by 4. So 6 fourths, that's 1 and a half, isn't it? So it's ever so slightly less than 1.5. And if you notice, these numbers, which are calculated using that ugly formula, are ever so slightly less than if I just did a crude division. Does anyone follow so far? Yeah. Now, just, can anyone tell me the reason why these are ever so slightly less? Can anyone guess? That's right. You're paying off things a little bit earlier. So because you're paying off a little bit earlier, you save that amount of interest rate. Um, for, so you're paying an annual interest rate of 6%, but you're paying it at the end of the second month. So, so the beginning of January, February, the beginning of March, the last day of February you're paying off. You're paying off the, the, the last day of December, the last day of February, or the first day of February. Of Mark, whatever. So you're paying off. So you're paying it rather than waiting to the very end of the year. You're paying it off ever so slightly earlier, and because of that, your capital is reduced, and you pay slight, You get a slight discount. It's like you pay back a little bit earlier. You save that interest amount, and 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 the amount that you save it is can be calculated using this. Now the, the numbers you get out of these things aren't going to be accurate if you if you just do a crude division. You know, I owe six percent. I'm going to pay, or I owe 12%, I'm going to pay monthly, so I'll just pay 1% a month. That makes sense. One twelfth of what I owe. But actually, you're going to be end up overpaying because the, the stuff you pay earlier um, gets taken care of and you don't pay interest on it for that, for that amount. Is that, is that clear what I've just said? Is that reasonably clear? Yes, but I have a question regarding to, to the coursework. Shall we do these tables separately or... We have to put it together with the budget and, and the your stuff, the, these tables. I mean, is this separate? Do we have to consider it as this is the interest rate table and this is the budget table? Or do we have to combine them in one table? Good question. And I'll answer that. So I've just received a question. I'll, 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 I'll repeat your question because it's, it's important enough for me to dwell on it a little bit or to elaborate a little bit. Um, so the question that was asked was, um, do we have to display this information in a separate table? Do we have to do a separate write-up? Do we have to include it in some other documentation or some other reporting? The real challenge in this particular coursework is to develop summary ways of explaining or relaying information. So um, what you're going to do is you're going to um, do quite a lot of calculations. You're going to have really big, ugly spreadsheets that are going to go on and on and on and on. I definitely don't want to see any of those things. I just want to see a summary table. Now, somewhere within that summary table, there'll be a little explanation saying, um, these were all calculated using a assumed monthly interest rate of 6.25. However, I calculated it on a weekly basis because I'm so precise and careful, in which case that weekly sum was this amount of money, this, this amount of interest. So it's a simple statement. Now, if you present, you're asking me, well, don't you want to see my work? Don't you want to see all these wonderful spreadsheets? 
that I've spent hours every number. No, I don't. And the reason is, if you do a good job with your report, um, in other words, you finish each sentence correctly, the grammar is good, the captions are labeled properly, they're introduced, there's a bit of analysis, everything's neat, you use U United, United Kingdom spelling rather than US spelling, you, your, your grammar is reasonably intact. Um, if you do all of these things carefully, I'm thinking, well, this guy took care with this report. I believe his numbers. I don't need to see every number. In fact, even if I were to see every number, I probably couldn't, just by looking at them, figure out. I'm going to look at the basic numbers. It's going to be a little different from one work to the next. You've made different assumptions. But the basic number I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe that you've done the calculations right. So what you have to do in this report, and this is what the challenge is, is to produce a document that stands up to itself, that's, that, can, that is um, robust. If I query it if, I, it, it, if you do it properly, I should be able to spot quickly where the error is, even from your summary table. I said, oh, I'm, I bet you he did this wrong. Now, this is the, um, the test of a well-written report. I see that it's a mistake. I can probably figure out where the mistake comes from just by the way you've summarized it. And I'll know, and, and, and actually you'll get almost full credit for that. I'll know that you've made a mistake, but you've done so in a kind of an honest way. And that you've done so in a way, you've re reported, you've presented what you've done in such a way that I can kind of read through, read between the lines. So I look at the key information. This is done on a weekly basis. These assumptions were made. I used this initial value. I made this assumption about that. And I can look, and the, and the final result fits into a little table about that big, and I can look at them and see if they're reasonable, if they're what I expect, and if they're way off, if you've made a colossal mistake, um, then I'll say, oh, I, I think I know what you did wrong. And I can say, go back and look at your spreadsheet and see where you've made that mistake. So that's the, that's the whole kind of concept behind the, the coursework. Most people really struggle um, let me think. A lot of people really worry about the detail of these things. You know, what month is the rent due? Uh, the interest rate is this, and I said this, this. You're dealing with um, future projections in this thing. You know, there's an element of guesstimate, you know, guesstimation. You know, you don't know what the interest rate's going to be. You don't know what delays the project's going to have. So what you're doing is you're giving me the most reasoned approach. And as long as I see what that reasoned approach is, and that your output is within sort of the limits of what I expect, that I'm likely to believe the kind of things that you're telling me in, in the report. So it's more of a, an opportunity for you to exhibit more about your managerial approach. How are you going to report these numbers? How are you going to take these big, huge spreadsheets that you've been working on behind the scenes, boil everything down in a way that doesn't drive me nuts, and that I can look at, and there's enough information in that summary so that I can see what your workings are. I can, I can guess. I've done, it, I've done this long enough so that I can sort of see. And the problems, you know, they, the problems are limited. You can, you can make some bad assumptions about the loans, about the repayments. You can mess up some of these tables. You can do the calculations. You can forget to include a, a whole unit or something. And I'll be able to pick up on that pretty quickly. Any more questions about the, the coursework, or...? <laughs> uh, George, just a quick one, right? Uh, the debt should be... Uh, no, you would not need effective interest rate, uh, sorry, effective interest rate for that, because it's non-cumulative, isn't it? And it's paid monthly off. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about that, Jay, a little bit, because it is, it is a good question. So, um, I mentioned to you, this is um, a kind of an exercise in a particular type of client. This is an institutional client. Many of you will have had these in the past. You will know what they're like. And this is um, a, a rather unusual institutional client in that it's an established educational institution. So there's a certain amount of reliability. They've been paying their bills for the last 750 years pretty reliably. We know that because they haven't been thrown out there in the same, this particular college is in the same location as it was 750 years ago. So it's been paying the rent or the mortgage or the fees quite regularly. So they're a, a pretty good um, risk, a pretty, pretty good risk. Um, 
And they also have a fairly big operating budget. You know, it's an institution of 400 uh, people. Um, there's, there must be 40 or 50 buildings. Um, the endowment is 120 or something million. So you're talking about a, an operating budget in the tens of millions. Um, so maybe they can afford, you know, to go over a little bit one month, maybe a million more than they had anticipated spending, more than they would normally spend that month. Um, maybe they'll make a savings on another month when the rents start coming in and when the uh, contractor isn't sending invoices. Maybe they'll be in a little excess for a period. But they have enough <coughs> leeway in their operations and their daily operations to be able to make payments that, that are, um, you know, that would seem big for you but for an institution of this size, wouldn't wouldn't seem large at all. Um, the other thing that they can do, and they have the capacity to do, I wanted you to be aware of this, is that they can actually play uh, plan a fundraising campaign. So if they have enough warning, if you are able to identify at the end of two and a half years, we'll have a deficit in March of four and a half million below our budget. We realize it might stretch you a little bit. We we um, suggest that you host or you plan a fundraising campaign. And if you raise a million or two million, um, then um, as long as you start about a year in advance, so you have to organize things, you have dinners, you have um, uh, events, you host a party or something, you get people together, you do some conference, I don't know. You just, they have a fundraising, actually they have a, a fundraising. I just heard from the college actually, they're doing a, um, 25th anniversary of the Medical Society. So they're organizing a big fundraising campaign amongst the, um, the doctors who have graduated from the, from the college. So they're going around, there's a bunch in America, there's some in Australia, so they're actually kind of doing a tour. Now if they, if they when they did this tour, they handed out a, a sheet of paper, which you have helped, you know, which you have helped produce, which has the funding requirements for this new building, they can say, you know, you can put, you can um, put your name down here, and we'll name a we'll name a stairwell after you, or one of the, I don't know, the hallway. We'll put your little plaque up saying that you put. Don't don't laugh. There's, if you look, if you go to some of the Oxford colleges, you see behind every seat there's a name of some some guy you gave who gave money. Um, so that's the, but they can't run these campaigns, they can't do this kind of fundraising without the sort of information planning that you're doing. So they really need to know what their cash position looks like at some one year, one and a half year in advance. They don't know, need to know exactly precise numbers, but they need to know roughly where they're going to be at any, at any given period of the next sort of four or five years. This is why what you're doing is important. That the project itself is roughly equivalent to about half of the size of the, of the entire endowment. The entire endowment is about 120 or something of this million. And the project is around 40, 45 or 48, something like that, million. So it's, it's, a big, it's the biggest project they've ever done. Um, so they have to, you know, they're worried about it, but they're not that worried about it. You know, they were able to raise a big chunk of money, about half the money they needed. And the rest they can do in as in terms of their regular uh, regular cash flow. Does that make sense? Does it, is that clear? That kind of, I mean, I, I think it's quite a good exercise um, because you're learning a little bit about one particular type of client. You know, this isn't this wouldn't be applicable to every client that you had or every sort of project. So you know, I was going to ask. Uh, I kind of don't think you answered this question about the interest rates not changing since it's a fixed. Um, a loan, it's a fixed loan, you can't, there's no interest being accrued. Oh, no, 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 no at all, it's, it's paid on a monthly basis. This yeah, particular it's fixed, so there's no, no interest no. rate calculations. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah, this is one, the one advantage and one disadvantage of a bond, this type of bond issue. Some bond issues you pay back so that by the time the bond matures fully, it's completely paid off. Yeah. This particular bond is you pay a monthly installment for the next, I don't know how many, 40 something years. And then at the end of it, you pay off that, um, the capital that you borrowed. That's how this one works. Um, a huge advantage is to having that. You know exactly what your monthly payments are. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the few knowns. That's, I mean, you know that 
And you also know the rental income because that's sort of decided ahead of time. You know, there's a, a regular increase every year that you know about. Um, but other things are quite unknown. You know, for instance, um, the timing of the of the payments for the construction. They could be held up, or they could finish early, and you know, end up invoicing you early. That kind of thing. So you're you you know roughly what you're going to pay. Um, but as long as your estimates or your sort of guesswork is reasonable, then there's no. Um, there's no reason to doubt, and of course there's, there's, there's risks associated with, but that's kind of covered in the next coursework, in the next set of lectures. You know, what, what things don't we really know, but can't we predict? How do we deal with things we can't predict very well? So, Excuse me, okay. what about the timing of the, of the repayment of the interest rate? Will it start from January 2019 or from the construction phase? No, 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 it starts from when, the, when you take the loan out. Yeah. So January... Yeah, yeah, it's already started already, so they're already paying it. Yeah. I mean, it's quite typical. They know they're going to build it. They probably have some sketches. They're probably putting in a, 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 a preliminary um, project approval to the planning. Um, they kind of, you know, that's how they get going. And it takes a while to get things started. It took more than a year, I think. Well, it didn't matter. They were still, they weren't losing any money on it. They own the land already. They bought the land hundreds of years ago, so, you know, they're not losing money on that. Um, any other questions? Can you read the risk management plan? That's later. So the next, the, the second coursework is about risk management. So you can separate them. So the stuff I've given you now are stuff that you know is quite predictable. The stuff I'm going to talk about in the next coursework, which I'm going to talk about after I finish this little discussion, that's about the unknowns, the things that you really don't know about. And exactly how to manage those, how those are managed in projects is really interesting. And I'm going to, I'm going to give a lecture about that later on. But before I'm going to give a lecture, I'm actually going to, I'm going to hand out the coursework and we're going to talk through it a little bit about what you need to do. Okay, is that it? Okay.